This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now I promised myself with this video that it was going to be concise, that it was going to be short, that it was only going to be 10 minutes. I have like five pages worth of notes so let's just jump into it, let's get into the video because if there's any rambling this is going to be a thousand years long. So today I wanted to talk about narratology and poetics and analyzing books. This is one of my very favorite things in the entire world. However the second I got out of doing my postgrad in creative of writing. I never really get the opportunity to talk about this very much anymore. So I wanted to make this entire video in which I just pretty much get to self-indulgently nerd out about allegory and iambic pentameter and stuff like that. Pretty much I just wanted to make this video so that if anyone wanted to dive deeper into their reading, if they wanted to learn how to pick apart prose on like a word by word level, and if people want to learn how to read more critically, they could have a bit of a resource that gives them an intro into basic basic tools that are used quite frequently. Just to begin with, a really short disclaimer on literature and what things constitute literariness. Just because an author writes a book that is plot heavy and they don't do a deep dive on Freudian semiotics while retelling a ancient Greek myth doesn't mean that it's any less valid. There was a time when Shakespeare was considered to be really quite lowbrow because members of the general public could pay to go and see his plays. And now we consider Shakespeare to be this very intelligent actor academic difficult thing to read. Around the time of Hans Christian Andersen, for example, just before he got popular, fairy tales, folklore, fantasy were all considered to be wives' tales. That's where that sort of word comes from. Because women and children were the only people who ever read those stories and they were considered to be beneath men who read very academic things like philosophy. And so we see that these things that were once considered to be very lowbrow and not at all academic change within how we perceive them. And this sort of argument about what constitute things that are literary and valid and what is trash and what is pulp and what is not. This argument has been going on for a really really long time and parts of it are quite silly because it's grounded in classism, colonialism, genderness and all of this kind of stuff and this is a topic that this video does not have time to get into. Just because a book doesn't have these specific narrative and poetic tools in it doesn't mean that book is any less good. The most important thing about a book in my opinion is whether it's engaging and whether it's fun you know, writing is an art, it's it's for enjoyment, it's for entertainment, and I personally have a lot of fun when analyzing craft related things, so that's why we're going to be talking about it today, but also all forms of literature are valid, all forms of books and writing are valid. Okay, so kicking it off with narratology, these are the basics. I'm not going to be able to cover every single aspect of narratology or poetics today, because otherwise this video would be very, very, very long. Pretty much I'm just going to be covering it at a sort of a high level, so that you you guys have some things to think about the next time you're reading. Narratology is really concerned with like the big elements of a story. So to begin with, you want to look at the fabula of the story. Now fabula is a really sort of academic way to say plot. Fabula is made up of your actors or your characters, the events of the story, the location or the setting, and time as well is the final element. So these four elements are going to really make up your plot. The next thing we can analyze when looking at narratology is your actual narrator. Okay, so for example, if your story is told in the first person, if it has a first person narrator, your story might read, I walk to the kitchen. I pick up an apple in the kitchen, I eat an apple. And so we have a lot of first person pronouns like I. If your story is written in the second person, you'll hear a lot of the word you. You walk to the kitchen, you pick up an apple, you eat the apple. A really good example of second person narration is in the story The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. And then finally we have third person narration. So you would say, Christy goes to the kitchen, Christy eats an apple, Christy da 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 da, right? So you would use the character's name. And so when you've picked up a story and you're reading it, look at the narrator and the narrative style and think about why the author is doing that. One really popular style is third person limited. So if you look at a story like The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon, it is told in the third person from four different character narrators. Some books are entirely limited to one character's third person perspective. So for example, 
called Harry Potter. A different way to do this is third person omniscient. Okay, so Mrs. Dalloway does this really well because there's this scene where the main character is walking through a street and the narrator is rapidly jumping in and out of the consciousnesses of different people on the street. And so this is a third person omniscient narrator who is all seeing and all knowing. And then you also want to look at reliability. Can you trust your narrator? Is your narrator unbiased? Probably not. Even if they're in the third person, every human being and every creature with perspective is going to have a certain level of bias and so your narrator is never going to be truly 100% reliable although some narrators are more reliable than others. Moving along to narrative structure so this is how your story is structured at sort of a really really macro kind of level. For example Frankenstein is a framed narrative so we start with Walton who says I'm going to tell you a story about this thing that happened. And then one of the characters in his story is Dr. Victor Frankenstein. And while we jump into Dr. Victor Frankenstein's perspective, he says, I'm going to tell you a story about this thing that happens. And then we dive a level deeper. So this one is also <laughs> framed symmetrically because it comes out of the story in the same order. Alternative to this is The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. So this is also a Gothic story. It's supposed to be a ghost story and it is a framed text. However, we begin with the first narrative frame of all of these people in this room trying to tell a story and then we dive in the first chapter into the key story and then we never come back to these people who are trying to tell the story at the beginning and so having this lack of symmetry with the narrative frames makes the reader at the very end feel a bit uneasy another good example is all the light we cannot see which is structured in these really sort of small fragments for example john green tends to use a lot of different structures in his stories so in Looking for Alaska, the first half of the book is counting down to something. Every chapter, I think in An Abundance of Catherines, he also uses a lot of footnotes. So it's another structural element that you can look at. The next one I want to talk about is focalization. Now this isn't something I actually looked at until I was at like a postgrad level, but I find this one really quite interesting. So when you're reading a story, it is always going to be from someone's perspective. You're always going to have a focalizer who's looking at different parts of the world. Now even if you have third person limited or third person omniscient, every sentence is going to belong to someone. Now, a good example of this is from Anne of Green Gables. Okay, so we have Marilla Cuthbert and Mrs. Lynde standing in the kitchen of Green Gables and Mrs. Lynde has never seen Anne before. Anne came running in presently, her face sparkling with the delight of her orchard rovings, but abashed at finding the delight herself in the unexpected presence of a stranger, she halted confusedly inside the door. She certainly was an odd looking little creature in the short, tight, wincy dress she had worn from the asylum, below which her thin legs seemed ungracefully long. And so even though this was the same paragraph, it's actually told from two different focalizers. And so we begin with Anne's perspective because she feels abashed. The word abash tells us that we are inside of Anne's consciousness and this is how she's feeling. There is the unexpected presence of the stranger and she halts confusedly. All of these words tell us what Anne is feeling internally as she sees Mrs. Lynn standing inside the kitchen. The next sentence, however, is from Mrs. Lynn's perspective because she's describing how she sees Anne because she thinks of Anne as being an odd looking little creature. And so even though Anne of Green Gables is written in the third person, we can see in this paragraph, these two sentences are from completely different focalizers. The next element is the actors of the story or the characters. Generally the actor or the character is going to be anything that is living that has agency of its own and can make decisions but sometimes you can have settings that are actors and of course you can often have animals that are actors. For example in the Traveling Cat Chronicle in which the character narrator is a cat. So yes character is pretty self-explanatory. Another kind of self-explanatory one is dialogue. So in American English this will be illustrated by quotation marks. In British or Australian English this will be illustrated illustrated by inverted commas. And then sometimes in other books, this will be stylized differently because it can be in italics. Sometimes dialogue is only in italics if it's representative of someone's thoughts and it's not really dialogue. These two things are definitely gonna be things that you guys are aware of, but they are also key elements of narratology as well. Okay, so next up is sequential ordering and time. Now, most stories are told chronologically from start to finish. Some stories, however, mix this up a bit. Never Let Me Go is a good example of this because it jumps back and forth through these really tiny, 
little structural fragments that jumps back and forth through time. You can have stories that are told over a long period of time, such as Pachinko. So this is set over the course of 60 or 70-ish years. You can also have stories that are told entirely in one day, such as Mrs. Dalloway. This story is also structurally interesting because it doesn't have any chapters at all. Also, another cool example of this is in To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. There is a section in the middle of this book where people are not narrating, time is the narrator, and like time doesn't exist, and it just sort of passes between the years. And so yes, time is obviously a big factor in narratology and in storytelling. Before we jump into speaking about poetics, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is a website builder that allows people to create really beautiful websites with ease. You guys are well aware by now that I built my website through Squarespace. I loved how much control I had over the design and how easy it was to set everything up and make it really pretty and aesthetically pleasing. Squarespace has powerful blogging tools which make it easy to show off your work and to connect with the people who are interested in the things that you make. I also love that Squarespace offers in-depth analytics tools which further help you to understand the people who are visiting your site. If you're looking to make a website, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jones to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Moving on to speaking about poetics. While narratology is concerned with the sort of like big high level structural parts of the story and like the really big elements, poetics is more concerned with the word by word of the prose. So the same thing with what we did with narratology, I'm just going to look at the key sort of areas of poetics. Again, I'm going to miss a whole bunch of things because otherwise this video would be very, very long. So the first one I wanted to speak about is rhythm and meter. Now, whenever you're reading a piece of writing, there's always going to be a certain cadence to the words. That's because when we're speaking, we can hear there's a sort of like tone and rise and fall in like the sound sounds that we hear. So if we kick off with a really famous example such as William Shakespeare, I'm going to read a little passage from my favourite play which is Macbeth. Now Shakespeare's plays are written in something that's called iambic pentameter which essentially means that the lines of his plays are going to be 10 syllables long and each alternating syllable is going to be stressed. So this means that if you took away every second syllable the most important part of each word is going to remain and pretty much you can get the gist of what that line means just from these stressed syllables. So I'll give you an example. For in my way it lies, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be, which the eye fears when it is done to see. And so when you consider this little section orally, so when you consider the sound of it, you can hear that it sort of like goes back and forth in this rocking sort of rhythm. Each second one is stressed, so each second one is the more important part of the word, and it is the place where we put the emphasis on our speech, and so we get this rocking back and forth sort of rhythm. It's generally easier to explore this in poetry than it is in novels because it's so much more pronounced in poetry, but if you look at the love song of J.R. Fred Prufrock, which is my favourite poem, it begins with, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. So you can sort of like, if you really pay attention to the way it sounds, you can hear the sort of rocking rhythm to the sounds. Okay, and so if we want an example, this is On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong. And I have only just started reading this and it is so incredibly beautiful. But if we start with like the very first page of the novel. Let me begin again. Dear Ma, I am writing to reach you. Even if every word I put down is one word further from where you are, I am writing to go back to the time at the rest stop in Virginia when you stared horror struck at the taxidermy buck hung over the soda machine by the restrooms, its antlers shadowing your face. In the car, you kept shaking your head. And so with novels, the thing that affects the rhyme and meter are like the choice of words, the fact that we had horror struck rhyming with buck, and also the use of grammar as well. So using stuff like the em dash and also having like that longer sentence joined by a shorter sentence afterwards changes the speed at which the reader naturally reads that passage. And so if you have a passage that has like sentences that are entirely the same length the whole way through, it feels really, really monotonous. But if you have long sentences and short sentences and medium sentences, it affects the 
the speed and cadence at which you read and how the book actually orally comes across. The next ones I want to talk about are alliteration, assonance, consonance and sibilance. These are four very specific word tools that authors use. Kicking it off with alliteration, this is when words in a passage start with the same letter. So the books bite brusquely before brunch, right? They all start with B's and so this is alliteration. <laughs> assonance is when you have similar vowel sounds within a word. So she sells seashells by the seashore. We have a lot of E sounds. So E is obviously a vowel and so that is assonance. Words that sound quite similar because of the vowels, so slow and road, those um, are linked through assonance. So authors tend to use this to link words and themes together. The next one is consonance, which is the same thing except with like the consonants. <laughs> so consonants with a C and consonants with a T. What did I write down? The cat can't count crackling clams. These all have like the k sound, like the hard C sound. And so it's similar to assonance, but it's just with consonants instead of vowels. And then finally, also sibilance. This is one that people don't really talk about very much, um, but I like sibilance because I like the imagery behind it. Sibilance is a similar thing again, but it's just S sounds. Sometimes Simon swims. It's a lot of S noises in here. The S sound can be linked with like snakes and sinister things. I really like sibilance because I think it's quite a little fun one. Next is allegory. This is one of my favorite things to analyze in a story. So allegory is when you're using a particular part of a story or even an entire story to explore something else within our society. So for example, in Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman, the author is using the people who fell between the cracks as an allegory for homelessness. And so Neverwhere is first and foremost a like fantasy story. It's a, a really fun like adventure story. But through the story, Neil Gaiman is also exploring a very serious and important topic because it is an allegory for homelessness. And so allegory is when you can sort of take a novel and you can experience it at like a, a fun sort of face level and then you can explore deeper societal themes underneath. I love allegory. I find it really, really interesting. One person who didn't like allegory very much was actually J.R.R. Tolkien. He famously doesn't like allegory. What did he say? He cordially dislikes allegory, even though um, lots of people will argue that The Lord of the Rings is an allegory for World War One, And of course, Tolkien fought in World War One. He didn't fight in World War II, I don't think. But yes, that is a fun, fun little argument that some people have about Lord of the Rings, whether it was or wasn't an allegory for war. Illusion is the next one I want to talk about. So that's not illusion. There's no like magical illusions happening today. Um, illusion is when we allude to something, but don't explicitly state it. So I'm going to get the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock back out. This is pretty much at the start of the poem. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Now this little passage is alluding to a cat. It's pretty obvious that it's alluding to a cat or at least some sort of cat-like creature, but it never explicitly states that it's a cat. So here we have an example of illusion. Metaphor, simile, and symbolism. Now you all would have heard of metaphor probably. Metaphor is when you link together two things that are not related because there are similarities between the two things. So for example, if I could pick out a random metaphor and I could say something like a bus is a daisy, right? So we can see that a bus and a daisy are linked because maybe they're both yellow, maybe because they're both like sort of intrinsically associated with childhood because buses are like school buses and children make daisy chains and stuff like that. So you find two things that are quite separate and you pair them together because they are linked in some way and that linkage is meaningful to the story. Um, simile is quite similar to metaphor except it's not quite as explicit. So if I were to have like the same sort of simile, I would say a bus is like a daisy. Okay, so using the word is like or is similar to um, softens it a little bit and has a bit of a different effect on the reader. You're still linking two things, except it's not quite as an explicit of a pairing. Symbolism is again a little bit more vague because you're just using different things in your story to symbolize something else. So for example, if we're looking at On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous, again, I'm only like 50 pages in, but it is so, so beautifully written and I love it. Um, in this story, at the very beginning at least, the author is pairing the image of monarch butterflies with 
migration and the migration of his family from Vietnam to the United States. And also in this text, the monarch butterflies are then again linked with fire and then linked with autumn leaves because they are a similar color. And so we see that these other images then get linked back to migration. And so we can see through symbolism that all of these images become linked. And I think that it's just really beautifully done because you get the sort of like nuance there of the like violence and fear of fire, the like fleeting beauty of autumn leaves and then the soft delicate nature of butterflies. It's just such a lovely like linking of different ideas with this very like important topic of migration. Another example that I desperately love is from the magic toy shop. Now there is a scene right at the beginning of this story. Melanie who is I think she's 14 in this story she goes and sneaks into her parents bedroom and she tries on her mother's wedding dress and then she wearing the wedding dress goes out into the nighttime and so in this story for her the nighttime is symbolic of adulthood while the safe domestic house is symbolic of her childhood the second she steps outside the door slams shut behind her and so we see that she was like reaching for like the scary outside world of adulthood and the second she stepped into it childhood slammed shut behind her and she couldn't get back in and that is quite scary. Melanie is a character who is like on the cusp of like womanhood and becoming an adult and all that kind of stuff and so like this journey is very important to her character arc. She starts trying to climb an apple tree. Now this has like a lot of symbolic meaning because apple trees and the blossoms are quite symbolic of fertility. We can link the apple tree back to like Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit and all that kind of stuff. Melanie is climbing up this apple tree and she's just ripping the crap out of her mother's wedding dress. Um, the wedding dress being white is like symbolic of virginity and then she eventually clambers back inside the house. And so in this one little scene of Melanie being locked outside in the nighttime in the dark and having to try and clamber her way back into the home, we have a lot of like symbolism and different themes being explored that all circle back to Melanie and the fact that she's on the cusp of adulthood and that she's exploring womanhood and what that means for her in her time period. And those were all of the tools I wanted to speak about to do with narratology and poetics. The point is that you use these tools to analyze why the author has tried to explore a particular thing or a particular area. We can get into this sort of sticky territory that Roland Barthes like started with the author is dead, authorial intent doesn't matter, but at the end of the day there is a person sitting behind that text and they are trying to explore certain themes and certain ideas through the text and you as a reader can go and pick them out and decide what that means for you and what you think that author was trying to achieve. And so for example coming back to that scene I talked about in the magic toy shop we can say that um, you know, the, the tree is symbolic of fertility, but why that's significant is because Melanie is growing into a woman and, and that is going to impact her life and she's trying to decide what womanhood means for her. So we can say, yes, the tree symbolizes this, but the important thing is why is the author trying to symbolize this? What are they trying to explain? What is the author trying to achieve? And what is the author trying to say about the world through those techniques and through that symbolism or through the allegory or through the use of like the passages of time through the characters and all of that kind of stuff. My favorite bit about reading a story is trying to discern why an author is trying to do something and what they're trying to say about the world. But yes, that is everything I want to speak about with narratology and poetics. Thank you guys so very much for giving me the opportunity to nerd out. I really do miss my postgrad quite a bit and I really, really loved studying. So I love talking about this stuff. If you guys are interested in hearing more about like writing craft and like this sort of area of analyzing books, please let me know in the comment section down below. I love this sort of stuff, but I don't think it's necessarily a topic that everyone is interested in. So please let me know if this is something that you're interested in. Thank you to everyone over on Patreon for supporting this channel. Take care guys, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.